Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to these historic ceremonies. Today, Major General Gary Luck will be promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General and will assume command of the United States Army Special Operations Command, which will be activated as the Army's 16th Major Command. We're waiting for the aircraft to position itself because of the winds aloft. We'll be with you in just a moment. I'm told one minute. If you look skyward, you'll see a UH-1 helicopter carrying four Green Beret military freefall parachutists who will exit the helicopter from 10,000 feet. They are directly overhead. They'll maneuver their open canopies for a landing right here at the John F. Kennedy Memorial Plaza. Minus 15 degrees. If, you're told, if your toes are cold, bear in mind that up in that aircraft, it's 15 degrees below zero. And if they've been waiting for 45 minutes at the top of the Please. Get them out of there. time now. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Jumpers away. Jumpers are away. The members of the team are Captain Alan Charters, Command Sergeant Major Henry Luthy, Staff Sergeant Richard Spear, and retired Command Sergeant Major Peter Morricon. The wind chill right now, you wouldn't believe. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> Four good canopies. Notice the drift of the smoke, how fast it's moving. They've got to gauge that wind speed up there because it's a little hard to fly against wind that is faster than you can make that canopy move forward. When the canopies get a little closer to the ground, you'll be able to notice that the new shoulder insignia of the United States Army Special Operations Command is emblazoned on the panels of the parachutes. You'll see a stylized spearhead which alludes to the shoulder sleeve insignia worn by the first special service force and signifies the heritage and traditions that we perpetuate today. The unsheathed black dagger symbolizes total military preparedness 
and has long been associated with Army Special Operations Forces. <coughs> This same insignia will be worn and displayed with the addition of a black and red airborne tab above the spearhead, indicating the airborne capability of the command. It doesn't matter, it's for the Captain Alan Charters is carrying the activation order that will be used in today's ceremony. And you were worried he wouldn't make it. <laughs> Somebody almost wore two uniforms. Notice how they are, the parachute is stalling. One more to go. While our last two jumpers are getting ready, you might notice the rosy cheeks. <laughs> Receiving the order is Major Peter Stewart, Secretary of the General Staff.
Today's ceremonies are hosted by the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Carl E. Vano. General Vano will also serve as the reviewing officer. The commander of troops is Brigadier General William Garrison, who is the Deputy Commanding General of the United States Army Special Operations Command. His staff is Colonel Juan Chavez, Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel. Colonel Nelson Smith, Jr., Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence. Colonel David McKnight, Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations. And Colonel Roger John, Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics. Music for our ceremony today is provided by the 82nd Airborne Division All-American Band under the direction of Warrant Officer Willie Lockett. Participating in today's ceremonies are Major General James Guest, Commanding General of the 1st Special Operations Command, Airborne. Brigadier General Joseph Herto, Deputy Commanding General, Reserves, and also the Commanding Officer of the United States Army Reserve, Special Operations Command, Airborne and Provisional. And Brigadier General David Barado, Commanding General of the United States Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. We are honored to have General James Lindsay, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Special Operations Command, join General Vano in promoting General Luck and in the activation of the United States Army Special Operations Command, now known as USASOC. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise while honors are rendered. The band will play ruffles and flourishes, recognizing the presence of our general officers. Please be seated. Please stand for the playing of our national anthem.
Please be seated. At this time, General Bono and General Lindsay will promote Major General Luck to Lieutenant General. Attention to orders. The President of the United States has reposed special trust and confidence in the patriotism, the valor, the fidelity, and the abilities of Gary E. Luck. In view of these qualities and his demonstrated potential, for increased responsibility, he is therefore promoted in the United States Army to the grade of Lieutenant General, effective 1 December 1989. By order of the Secretary of the Army, signed Carl E. Vano, General, United States Army, Chief of Staff. From the earliest of times, leaders used a banner or other symbols to identify themselves and to serve as a rallying point for their warriors. For the modern day soldier, his unit's colors still serve such a purpose. It's the colors which record the unit's history, its glories, its battles, and its campaigns. Command Sergeant Major Ron Strahan of the United States Army Special Operations Command will present the encased colors to General Vano will then remove the canvas covering. Headquarters, Department of the Army, Washington, D.C., General Order Number 39. Effective 1 December 1989, the United States Army Special Operations Command, with headquarters at Fort Bragg, is activated. The United States Army Special Operations Command will serve as a major command and as the Army Component Command of the United States Special Operations Command. The 1st Special Operations Command, Airborne, and its assigned elements are reassigned as a major subordinate command of the United States Army Special Operations Command. The United States Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School is placed under the operational control of the United States Army Special Operations Command. The United States Army Special Operations Command, in coordination with the National Guard Bureau and State Adjutants General, will oversee and evaluate the training of the United States Army National Guard Special Operations Forces. The United States Army Reserve Special Operations Forces will be under the operational control of the United States Army Special Operations Command until reassigned by Headquarters, Department of the Army, no later than October 1991. By order of the Secretary of the Army, Carl Ivano, General, United States Army, Chief of Staff. Headquarters, United States Army Special Operations Command, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Subject. Assumption of command by authority of paragraph 2-3 Alpha, Army Regulation 600-20. The undersigned assumes command of the United States Army Special Operations Command, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, effective 1 December, 1989. Signed, Gary E. Luck, Lieutenant General, United States Army, commanding. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to introduce the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General Carl Vano. Well, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, fellow soldiers, what a great ceremony and what a great day to be at Fort Bragg. Uh, the opportunity to host uh, this assemblage of magnificent soldiers and participate uh, in the activation ceremony of the Special Operations Command is indeed a great pleasure to me. And I want to welcome back all the uh, distinguished veterans 
of special operations, all of those who have served before and have acted as such great role models for all of us. I know it's a proud day for each and every one of you, and I'd like all of the old special ops guys stand up. If you're standing already, raise your hand. <laughs> The activation of this command is a significant event for our Army and to all who have contributed so much to national security over the years. And as I stand before this splendid formation of troops, I'm proud, extremely proud, because today we take another step for the fulfillment of a vision of a uniquely versatile force, specially trained and ready for deployment worldwide. And that vision was first manifested in spirited colonial American soldiers who with painted skin and brown and green garb combined discipline, stealth, and innovative tactics to win against an enemy in the forest. And this is a tradition of valor that has endured in our army through over 200 years of peace and war. And building on that heritage over the last several years, the Army has revitalized its Special Operations Forces, resulting in a new Special Forces branch, dynamic command and control concepts, innovative unit designs, and modern lethal equipment. And activating the United States Army Special Operations Command this morning is the major step in that revitalization. This command, with its Special Forces, Rangers, Special Operations Aviation, psychological operations, and civil affairs forces in both our active and reserve forces is vital to this nation's combat capability. And combined with our heavy and light forces throughout the globe, they give us an indispensable ability to configure force packages appropriate to meeting whatever challenges we may confront today and in the 90s and beyond. And so this command epitomizes to me the versatility that is so essential to our Army of today and to our role as a strategic force vital to our nation as we move into the next century. And this major command will be instrumental in ensuring that the Army's Special Operations Forces, both in the active and the reserves, will continue to be trained to a razor's edge and fully prepared for any mission. And one of the most important keys to that success will be its new commanding general, Lieutenant General Gary Luck. It has a nice ring to it, doesn't it, Gary? <laughs> now, you heard the reading of the promotion orders, which refer to the special trust and confidence in Gary's Luck's patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities. And on the basis of these qualities, no one is more deserving of this promotion, and we congratulate him on this achievement. And if I can add a personal note, there's nobody that the Chief of Staff of the Army has more confidence in than Gary Luck, because I've known Gary Luck since he was a young captain. I've served with him in peace and war, and there's nobody in our Army better suited to lead this magnificent command. And as the outgoing Commanding General of the Joint Special Operations Command, Gary keenly understands joint warfighting. He's a soldier with broad experience. He appreciates the need for integrating doctor and organization, training, and above all, leaders into our programs. And these programs will build on the great foundation set by Jim Lindsay and Jim Guest standing out there, who I know is chest swelling with pride for all he had to do to bring on this command. And it's a command of a trained and ready Army Special Operations Forces, prepared to fight and win if called upon on any battlefield today and tomorrow. And in short, Gary Luck is a leader with a deep commitment to Special Operations, and he has pursued that commitment with purpose and determination. He understands how the Army and Special Operations Forces must be shaped for the future. And these qualities, as I said, set him apart as the right man at the right time to be the first commanding general of this major command. And let me tell you one other thing about Gary Luck. I don't know of a leader in our Army today 
from sergeant through general who has a greater love for soldiers than this man has. And I can assure you he'll take care of every soldier and every family member active and reserve in this magnificent command. And I'm proud to stand with him in our commitment to take care of our soldiers. And so I know that under his leadership, this command will maintain its central role in the Army's force structure as we move into the next decade and face future challenges. And finally, a word to the troops represented here and serving all over the world as we talked this morning. Your commitment, past and present, has been vital to the Army and to our nation. And with a continued superb effort and support of every member of the Special Operations Team, military and civilian active and reserve, I know that we will remain a fighting force without equal in the world today and the ultimate guarantors of peace and freedom. So I, as I look at the assembled units represented here, and I look around at the many friends of the Army coming out to see this ceremony, I'm filled with admiration and pride. I admire the selflessness of those who serve our country, and I'm confident that the highest standards of excellence that have been your hallmark in carrying out the Special Operations mission will continue in the future. The United States Army Special Operations Command is and will continue to be without equal a high quality trained and ready force. I congratulate you. Gary, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you and God bless the United States of America. General James Lindsay, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Special Operations Command, will now address soldiers of the Army's newest major command. I first got a, a couple of administrative announcements. The first has to do with the noise you heard when we came up here in the background. I saw a young major or captain or somebody running frantically over there trying to shut that off, and I was trying to, I wanted to yell and tell him, stop, let him, I can talk over it, let him keep working, because for those of you old-timers here who grew up here on Smoke Bomb Hill, spent 30 years in World War II wooden barracks, we've been waiting 30 years for that academic facility, and I want them to get started just as soon as they can. <laughs> and, uh... The second administrative announcement has to do with the uh, uh, speed with which we put this ceremony together. Some of you I know in the audience, especially some of the distinguished civilians here, got your invitations about two days ago, and I really appreciate you being here. There are a number of great soldiers like Bill Yarborough who, because of the shortness of time, simply couldn't be here. But it was a function of the fact we've been working on this for a long time. We finally got the Secretary of Defense's approval of the whole process couple weeks ago and we decided to strike while things were hot and we wanted to get on get the command up and get the things moving and so that's why we moved out with it, and I hope you all understand that it's a great day for special operations for our special forces our psyops our civil affairs our rangers our special ops aviation it's literally a dream come true and as I look around and see a lot of the folks here in the audience I remember some of you served here with back in the 50s here on Smoke Bomb Hill and to think that this would be happening today, as I say, is, is truly a dream come true. I'd like to take a few minutes now and try to recognize some of the people that, that made this dream happen. There's no way I can recognize all of the old and the bold. There's just too many of them. But uh, I, they, they, their contribution is something that you just can't talk enough about. Because if you stop and look at the, what they did, they came into Special Forces, they knew from a career standpoint it was pretty much a dead-end street. They did it anyway out of love for country, love for what they were doing. They served and they served well. They served magnificently. And I would also say the same for their families because those of you who are in the business know this is really probably as tough a life for a family as any in the world. And all of you just made a, a wonderful contribution. I was hoping that Bill Yarborough could be here today because he, of all the old-timers, one I wanted to recognize. He's the one, as you know, designed our jump wings, the jump boots we wear, and, and led the revitalization of special operations in the early 60s. More recently, there have been a number of key players. I would have to recognize Senator, uh, Secretary of the Army Jack Marsh, who was a key player in all this, and especially the former Chief of Staff of the Army, Shy Meyer. He was Chief of Staff from 1979 to 1983, and he was a real visionary. And uh, he saw the changing world, and he realized the role special operations had to play in that world, and he started, he, he created the 
the, a, a semi-foundation, you might say, that permitted us to get to where we are today. In that process, he was assisted by Bob Kingston, a former commander here of uh, the center, uh, General Jim Vaught, who's here with us today. And most recently, this thing really got rolling again, and a combination of Leroy Suttoth, commander here at First OCOM, and Jim Guest, who was then the commander of SWIC. Suttoth started it, and Jim picked it up and moved with it. And Jim Guest and the SOCOM SWIC staff really deserve a round of applause for an absolutely superb job bringing this all together. <laughs> Two other people. One is retired General Joe Palastra. He was the former commander of U.S. Forces Command. And this whole proposal would have ground in the bureaucracy if he hadn't reached in there, thrown out the briefing slides, and said, I don't really care that much about the briefing. We're going to do it. The briefing would have led him to conclude he couldn't do it. But he made it happen. And finally, General Carl Bono preceded me here on the stand. Uh, Carl, like Shymeyer, is a visionary. And the first thing I noticed when he became chief of the Army, chief of staff of the Army back in 1983, up to that time, they'd, when talking about Army forces, people talked about heavy and light. Suddenly, there was a shift in that. It was heavy, light, soft. And if you listen to any senior leader in the Army today, they talk about heavy, light, special operating forces. And Carl Bono, again, cut through the bureaucracy and made this happen. And not only did he make it happen, but he has really protected us. He's looked after the whole community. Yesterday, he and I spent the whole day in a very, very uh, tough, two tough sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, with the Secretary of Defense and the Chiefs and everyone looking towards the future of the military. Clearly, we're going to have a smaller military. But I can tell you, in the whole process and the things that led up to it, he protected Army SOF, and as a result, whereas everything else is going to get smaller, Army SOF is not. Army SOF is going to grow in the years to come, and that's a direct tribute to Carl Bono and, and Gordon Sullivan, his desk ops over here, and a number of other people who've really been supportive. And I might add that the Force Comm staff, General Wiegand, and uh, the people on the DA staff have also worked very closely with us throughout this process. And we've still got a lot left to do. We've got to figure out a structure as to exactly how we're going to help General Herto and the reserve components. A lot more work to be done, but we're moving forward and we're doing it. There's a very good reason for that. Our special operating forces have a unique role in the world today. Clearly, the relationship between the superpowers is changing. But if you look out in the lesser developed nations of the world, in the third world, we live in what you might call a violent peace. And our special operating forces provide two things that are vital in that, whole, in that arena. One is a surgical capability to deal with those very complex, difficult situations that often arise. But in the long term, their major contribution is going to be as nation builders, which you might call preventive medicine. And if you look to the challenge of the 90s and the early part of the next century, that, that's where the action is going to be, and that's where you're going to find your Special Forces folks. The last two years, we've deployed 487 teams in 63 different nations. And as we speak, there are people spread literally all over the world working with lesser developed nations of the world, working with other countries, doing what I say is what you might call nation building. Now, not only have we recognized what they're doing with the establishment of this command, but the Army personnel system, if you will, is recognized. And if you look at any recent promotion list, the people in the special forces business, the special ops business, are ahead of the rest of the Army. And they get, in terms of personal satisfaction, there's a great personal satisfaction there. But again, for the families who are here today, I recognize you pay a price because your spouses are gone an awful lot, and we understand that. Final thing, I'd like to <coughs> add to what General Bono said about the great soldier we've chosen to lead this command. Gary Locke is uniquely well qualified for it. He's, you might say, a man for all seasons. He's got a PhD, a doctorate in ops research systems analysis. He's commanded in armor, he's commanded in air cavalry, he's commanded mech infantry units, been a division commander in Korea. But most importantly for you Special Forces folks here, he's had assignments in the 5th Special Forces Group, the 3rd Special Forces Group, and the 7th Special Forces Group, and he led an A-team in combat in Vietnam, and I'm very proud to be a good friend of Gary Lux. Gary, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Gary Luck, the Commanding General of the United States Army Special Operations Command. Well, just another average day. <laughs> it's unbelievable. General Vano, Secretary Locker, General Lindsay, Sergeant Major Julius Gates, distinguished visitors and honored guests. And uh, most importantly, the soldiers of the newly created United States Army Special Operations Command. It's an honor to be a part of this uh, 
historic occasion. The activation of the United States Army Special Operations Command. It, uh, it really uh, makes me feel good all over just to be here, let alone be designated and honored to be the commanding general. The establishment of this command, uh, as all of us know, is evolutionary. Uh, the chief talked about it. The sink talked about it. Special operations have played a vital role in our nation's defense since the beginning of, of, of our uh, country. They've been employed by our leaders in every major conflict, and they've always, always performed magnificently, many times without recognition, uh, but never driven by recognition for that performance. As we view uh, the television reports nightly, we see how the changes that are out there are having an impact on us. Uh, we're influenced uh, by perestroika. Uh, we're influenced uh, by this and that. And daily we read about the articles calling for massive troop reductions as well as for major cuts in defense spendings. But as all of this world out there changes, we must remember that the United States Army continues its role regardless as the nation's strategic force. I've read and heard uh, General Vano comment on numerous occasions that uh, the Army is the nation's strategic force and our borders are global and we have a global responsibility. Special operations soldiers in that regard must remember that they are not only a tactical force but are also a strategic force. Our command has uh, missions that reach across the entire operational spectrum. Whether it's foreign internal defense and low intensity conflict or special reconnaissance in global warfare, special operations command soldiers have a vital role in our nation's defense regardless of the nature that's required for that defense. USASOC will serve as a special operations focal point for the total army. The active army, the National Guard, and the Army Reserve Special Operations Forces now have a single headquarters responsible for their organization, training, logistics, and readiness. As a major command, we will report directly to headquarters, Department of Army, for service matters and for other things as uh, desired by the boss. <laughs> Operationally, we will be the Army component for United States Special Operations Command uh, at McDill, commanded by General Lindsay. As I look around and see all the distinguished visitors here, many of whom served in special operations over the years, both in peace and in war, I share with you uh, the enthusiasm for seeing this command stood up today. It gives me a source of deep pride, and I know it does you. We are not a Special Forces Command or a Green Beret Command. We are a Special Operations Command. From direct action units that nobody knows anything about to those with sophisticated communications and information dissemination equipment, USASOC provides this country a unique capability, a capability that can support conventional or conduct unconventional operations. We are the perfect force to lead the Army's strategic options in these turbulent times. The establishment of USASOC is not an ending, not a final step in the improvement of special operations. Our soldiers are the most dedicated our Army has to offer. Our equipment is the finest the country produces. I assure you we will continue our upward spiral. There are a lot of people responsible for the revitalization of uh, special ops. Many of them here today we're part of that effort, and I can't recognize each and every one of you. But I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize those who led, those who led the charge. General Lindsay's talked about them. Uh, he didn't include himself, so I'm going to talk about them again. Three of them participated in this ceremony today. General Vono, General Lindsay, and Jim Guest all provided the impetus needed with their great staffs to make this happen. 
and retired General Palastra, General Powell, and now General Berber at Forces Command uh, took a hold of the rope and pulled in the right direction as well. I salute particularly General Vono and General Lindsay for having the vision and the positive support, or giving the positive support that made it happen. However, if it weren't for the drive and enthusiasm of Major General Jim Guest, we wouldn't be here today activating this Special Operations Command. General Guest and his staff never gave up in the difficult pursuit of activating this unit. There were and still are naysayers out there, but their doubts, and in some cases their outright pessimism, didn't deter Jim and his staff here at Bragg. Jim, the special operations community, soldiers, retirees, veterans, and civilians owe a lot, lot to you. You're an outstanding warrior, and on behalf of everyone, thank you for what you did. Now, it says here I'm supposed to make some personal remarks on promotion. First thing they told me, I never read a speech before in my life. It just, I just getting all dry mouthed about it. But <laughs> they said if you're a three or four star general, you have to do this. <laughs> and I'm not sure it's worth it. <laughs> but I was uh, standing there trying to get my hat and everything ready yesterday. And uh, I looked in the mirror and I, I did the only thing I could think was, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Yeah, I never, never believed it. Uh, and then uh, my, my trusted staff and everything, we bought the wrong kind of stars and everything, so that's, well, well we got it almost together, and it's probably about as together as I am about this thing. I, I'm deeply honored and uh, accept this promotion on uh, uh, behalf of uh, everybody that, that made me look good over the years. Uh, my only strength is uh, to, to have trust and confidence in people, and uh, I've been lucky. Uh, all the way along to, to work for people that uh, were very professional, that could be trusted, and uh, performed uh, magnificently uh, in everything they did. And then when they'd finished, they'd run me out in front and somebody would say, hey, you really did a good job. And I guess the only thing I never was really truthful about, I, I, I probably always smiled and said, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> but I am very honored to, to be promoted. I, I'm just honored to serve. Uh, uh, the country, and yeah. very honored to be uh, uh, in the United States Army, and very honored to be uh, uh, back as part of the Special Operations Command. And uh, I'm extremely pleased to see so many friends uh, uh, here today. And I, I thank you for coming, and uh, I thank you for helping me along the way. And uh, I promise you, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Uh, but the same deal uh, pertains. Uh, Y'all got to make me look good, because you leave it up to me, I'll probably screw it up. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thanks a lot for the four months. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the playing of the Army song. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. 
please wait until the official party departs the plaza area. Thank you for joining us at this historic activation ceremony of the newest Major Army Command, the United States Army Special Operations Command. One more thing. You gotta change this. Make this radio. I gotta go move.
can't complain. I said, I told him, I told him to miss a Put me on the code letter. If I end up on a code letter, you guys done your job. If not, we're in trouble. I hit the code letter. So did everything else. We, uh, we, uh, a couple of guys. Uh, well, they, they're, they're, they're busy. They're all the time doing something. They never get... <laughs> Good. Very good. Look forward to getting to know you and doing better. Good, sir. Hey, Paul. Bad for a junkie.